What's up everybody? Thanks for checking out this video. This cabinet was one of those ideas that woke me out of a dead sleep and it took me about a year to finally get to the point of actually making it. Now a lot of these processes are a little bit outside of my normal workflow so I did have to reach out to a couple friends along the way and all you've seen me do so far is make the melamine forms which my greatest fear was having hundreds of dollars worth of epoxy all over the floor. Hello this is Johnny. What's up my Oklahoma? Chris, dude, my favorite Canadian. Okay, I'm building some epoxy molds and I was really hoping for some help, maybe some tips on what I should be doing. The most obvious step is to make sure you've got like a really nice smooth surface, kind of like this uh, UHMW that I'm looking at right here. I have no clue what that is. It's ultra high molecular weight polyethylene. Okay, what if I already cut up like a hundred bucks worth of melamine? I mean, yeah, I guess that'll work as well. Just make sure you seal all those edges with a good quality acrylic latex caulk. And most importantly, if you're gonna use melamine, make sure you cover the surface with tuck tape. I mean, you're in Canada, you should be able to get tuck tape. I'm pretty sure that's where they make it. You know it. You know, some folks use mold release, but you know, that doesn't leave a whole lot of margin for error. Let's say you like do something crazy, like forget to add the mold release. Who would actually do that? All right, after talking with Johnny, I felt way better about the process, so I started assembling my melamine forms. I should have said this earlier, but I made sure that my forms were at least an inch higher than what my overall piece would be. And once the caulk had started to set up, I used my nail gun just to make sure that all the seams were held together as best as possible. I had to build four different forms for this project, one for each of the sides, the top, and the front. With my forms done and put aside, I started prepping all the walnut that would fit inside the forms. And I have to say, this was an oddly satisfying process. It was like putting together a puzzle. I mainly used my track saw for this, however the miter saw came in quite handy for making the 90s on the corners. Just make sure that you're going slow, just in case there's any tension in the wood. And here's one of those oddly satisfying moments. With that done, I moved on to the casting of the material, and one tip I did see online was to seal all the edges of your material. This will help prevent air bubbles along the way, and I just used Total Boat High Performance for this. However, for the casting, I did use Total Boat's Thick Set for this. Now because I was tinting the epoxy black, I did make sure to seal all the surfaces of the wood, just to do what I could to prevent any staining on what would be the tops and sides of the actual piece. Black pigment is of course black pigment, so I knew that it would stain my piece if I didn't prep them this way. Total Bolt Thick Set has an amazing open time. I made sure to really stir everything as best as I could before I started my pour. And here's that satisfying part that you might have been waiting for. Now I did have a pretty catastrophic failure at this point, but it had nothing to do with the epoxy. I actually lost the memory card that had all this footage. So you'll notice that maybe it's not as crisp as I would like it to be, and maybe the coloring is a little off. I had to go through a pretty intense process of recovering the memory card that had all this footage on. Luckily we were able to get it back, and well, it turned out as best as it could considering the situation. I let these pieces sit for about a week just to make sure that the epoxy had fully cured. And I'm sure you eagle eyes have already noticed that I've missed something. I for sure used a decent amount of mold release, but at the last second I decided the tuck tape probably isn't something that I need to do. And most of the forms actually came off okay. However, there were some where I might have forgotten to actually apply mold release, or I didn't let it dry for long enough before doing the pour. I had one that for sure I forgot to add mold release to, which was one of the sides. Use tuck tape. Dude, don't forget the tuck tape. What if you forget the mold release? Now, I ended up using this electric planer as well as my drum sander to get off the materials, but it took way longer than it needed to. 
In the future, 100% of the time, I will be using tuck tape. Now, I was able to visit a buddy shop and use his Y belt sander for the wider pieces. And then I was ready to start prepping everything to square off my pieces and cut them to final size. I took several cuts along the way, just sneaking up on perfectly square pieces. I basically used my track saw as a joiner, so I'd be able to square everything off the fence on my table saw. And with that complete, I cut all my pieces down to their final size. The bottom of the cabinet will not be seen, so I cut that out of just some walnut plywood that I had laying around. However, I did mill up some hardwood edge banding as opposed to just using an iron-on, and I did this as well for the center divider. I left all my hardwood edge banding long, and then just came back and squared everything off at the table saw. With that, I was able to clean everything up with my random orbital sander. Now for assembly, I did just go with the domino, which essentially is foolproof. Well, I guess unless you're a fool and put your dominoes in the wrong spot. I totally gapped on the fact that I inset the bottom three quarters of an inch just to make sure that I had enough room for my drawer faces and the cabinet door. Now it's been a while since I've done butt joints versus doing miters. And the rationale was simply that my pieces weren't going to match up anyways. There would be no continuity to the grain. As well, I actually kind of like the look of the edge grain on the top of the cabinet of this. So I just kind of went with it. I spent so much time designing and prepping the top of the cabinet that I really didn't know what I was going to do for a base. So luckily I had some time to call in for some help. Everybody, welcome back to another episode of Fixing Your Designs. Today I'm here with Chris Crawford, who's having a little trouble with a sideboard that he's designing right now. So why don't we just jump in the call and see what's going on? Hey, Chris, how's it going? Good, good. How are you doing? Good. So I hear you're having some trouble with the sideboard you're working on. Yeah. What's the issue? Well, I, I spent a lot of time just with the upper part of the cabinet, but mm -hmm. I just, I don't know what to do for a base. I, I did try these legs from Semi-Exact. Um, I, I don't know. Yeah, I'm looking, I'm looking at it right now and it seems like you kind of just phoned it in. Like it's kind of an afterthought with the base. Well, I wouldn't say it's totally an afterthought. I mean, I see you put a lot of design work into the top. You've got, it looks like some like inlaid epoxy. It's kind of looks like it's like a zebra tiger cabinet or something like that. But then you just screwed on some legs. Well, uh, I think I've got a couple ideas. Um, why don't I work on it a little bit and then we can meet back up and I'll, I'll uh, tell you what I came up with. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'd appreciate that. If you have some better ideas, I'm definitely open to them. Awesome. All right. Talk soon. All right. Well, I spent some time working on some designs. I think I got some pretty good ideas. So why don't we give Chris a call back and we'll see what he thinks about them. I've uh, got some ideas for you. So I was thinking, you know, I, I like what you did with the top, but it kind of felt like the bottom, you just screwed some legs on there. So I thought that we should tie them together uh, a little more. Okay. So since it's kind of like a tiger top, what about like tiger claw feet? Like, a you know, they've got like the ball and claw foot. What about like a tiger paw foot? Like from a real tiger? Well, no, but you know, you might like, if you, got, do you guys have tigers in Canada? Um, do you have access to tiger feet? Because if you do, that could be cool. Maybe like, you know. I mean, I can, do you know any taxidermists? I, well, I mean, everyone kind of taxidermists is a taxidermist here. Yeah. Another idea I was thinking, um, what about like cinder blocks? Stack it on a couple cinder blocks, maybe like for building a house. Yeah. You know, just go down to the home center. I don't know. What, what do you guys, do you guys have Home Depot there in Canada? Yeah, we have Home Depot, Chris. Okay. So maybe go down to the Home Depot, grab a couple cinder blocks, just throw those at each corner. Okay. That's another idea I had. Um, something else I was thinking, I don't know. Do you want this to be mobile uh, or is it going to be kind of stationary? Not, no, I think. Well, but you might want it to be at some point. So if you did skateboards, Hey, I've got one more design idea that I haven't told Chris about yet. I think he's really going to love it. So why don't we surprise him with it right now? Oh, Hey Chris, I actually have one more idea that it's kind of a secret. I think you're going to like this one. Awesome. I'm all, all so, yours. I actually worked to design a set of legs that you can buy right off the shelf and, and put onto your piece with a company called Semi-Exact. They're called the Spider Legs. I don't know if you're familiar with them. Yeah, they're the legs. That they come in, well, these are black, but they also come in yellow. 
Oh, okay. And I think that would really make this piece pop. Um, but those are the legs that I'm putting on it. Yeah, but these are not yellow. Uh, and again, I think that's going to make this thing pop. It's going to sing. But Well, I think that's enough for today. So everybody, I hope you enjoyed this episode. I hope you found it informative. Um, I think Chris really liked the design and that makes me happy. Despite Chris's expert advice, I decided to just put the base on hold for a second and I moved on to assembling the inside of the cabinet, starting with the vertical partition. I actually realized at this point that my cabinet top had bowed a little bit, so it took a little bit more finagling to be able to get it into square again, but I just attached everything with screws through the bottom and then the pocket holes at the top. Here's the part that I've probably been dreading the most, and that's starting the process of cutting up my fronts for the cabinet. I started with the cabinet door and it fit perfectly, no issues. What I did do is I trimmed everything to length and width, which I should not have done. I should have gotten one corner, say my left side and my top, perfectly square, but left everything else long. I'll get back to this a little bit later on in the video. For the sake of time, I have glazed over this section of the video where I install the cabinet doors. If you have questions about this process, please feel free to ask them below. But for hardware, I did use the Blum 180 degree 3 quarter inch inset drawer hinges and the Blum push to open cabinet door latch. If you're interested, I'll put the links to this hardware down in the description. I was at a point now where I could finally start working on my drawer boxes. Unfortunately, I designed this cabinet with only two large drawers, so it wasn't a really difficult process. But like with any drawers, it just does take time. Now, I didn't have any matching edge banding, so I decided to go with this walnut edge banding that I had from another project from a little while ago. And I convinced myself that this was artsy, so I was okay with the fact that the edge banding didn't match my material. You've probably seen me using these brass setup blocks quite a bit this year. It's a new addition to my shop, and for doing things like doing rabbits on drawer boxes, man alive, it just makes setup so much easier. And I know I've talked about this before, but I always make sure to encapsulate my drawer bottom into all four sides of my drawers. And of course, the king of the drawer carcass assembly is the pocket hole. With my pieces ready to be assembled, I cut out my mahogany door skin for my drawer bottom. And if you've used pocket holes, you know that they sometimes do slip. So, of course, make sure you clamp your material down. For drawer slides, I did go with a push to open drawer slide. And I used just cutoffs of 2x4s, as well as 3 quarter inch plywood, to get my spacing just right. Now, like I mentioned earlier, I trimmed my front to the exact size of the opening. And the issue with that is, well, I didn't take into account the curve of the saw blade. So all my reveals ended up having to be a lot larger than I wanted them to be. Now, if I was to do this again, I would definitely make sure to leave everything oversized and cut down to my final size, as opposed to starting with my final size and working from there. This was a bit of an afterthought, but I had this really wide piece of walnut live edge from another project that I thought would actually make a really cool shelf. Let me know what you think in the comments. You know, maybe this makes the piece look unfinished, but I thought it added a really neat detail to the inside of the cabinet. It also gave me the opportunity to finally use the Rockler shelf pin jig. Now, I was actually really nervous about the finishing of this cabinet. I knew I'd have to spend a lot of time sanding, but the actual finish itself, I truly wasn't sure what I was going to use. Hello. Hey Jason, how's it going? Hey Chris, what's up? Okay. Finishing. Yeah, well basically what I do with any piece. K. Yeah, K. That makes sense. I guess I should ask, what kind of piece of furniture are we talking about? Well, it's a sideboard, but the kick is I cast Live Edge Walnut in black epoxy. Oh, okay. Well then scratch what I just said. Here's what you're going to want to do. Do you have like a big bin or something? Just something big enough that the piece will fit inside. Yeah, anything will work like a Rubbermaid big tub or... Um, 
Yeah, I might need a bigger rubber made. Even a garbage can will work. So you just stick the whole piece in there. And then if you go to Home Depot um, and go to their like cement department, any bag cement will work. Okay, like 10 bags? Just mix up a bunch of that cement and then you're just gonna kind of pour it all around the piece inside there until it's good and just completely covered with that cement mix. And then, um, do you have a boat? Okay, we'll find someone who's got a boat and borrow that. Okay, and then what you wanna do is load the whole thing on there, drive like way the heck out in the middle of the ocean. Yeah, not a lot of oceans here on the prairies in Canada. Also, I might have to wait till this thaws out. Yeah, yeah, and then just dump it in. They just let it sink to the very bottom. Yeah, epoxy furniture is ugly and um, there's even, there's just no point in even finishing it. So yeah, hopefully that helps. All right, yeah. You too, okay, bye. <laughs> epoxy furniture, what an idiot. I realized that I probably called the wrong guy for advice on how to finish any kind of furniture that incorporates epoxy. It was actually suggested to me by the guys at Windsor Plywood and Sherwood Park just to use a hard wax finish. I really like how this finish really brightened up the walnut. And it was super easy to apply. After buffing it into the surface, I let it dry and then came back with a clean cloth and just brought it up to a shine. I would for sure suggest at least doing two coats. Now Semi-Exact did send me these black spider legs and instead of the yellow. So I decided just to go with that despite Chris's expert advice. And the irony of it is, if I didn't have these legs, I probably would have built a wooden version of them. And with that, this project was done. This is by far one of the most involved projects that I've ever built. It's amazing to me all the extra steps that go into doing something like this. And my wife's reaction was pure gold. When she saw it for the first time, her instant reaction was, wow, I like it more than I thought I was going to. This was also one of the funnest videos I've ever done. So if you like this format of maybe having some interaction from some outside makers, let me know in the comments below. Huge thanks to Johnny, to Chris, and to Jason for helping out with this video. But more importantly, thank you for tuning in. I appreciate the support. If I've earned it, I'd love to see you hit that subscribe button. Hey, if you want to see some of my other furniture builds, I've added some links here.